The history of the nuclear bomb started long before Hiroshima. This scientific breakthrough was made in the 18th century. That was when Martin Klaproth discovered a radioactive element that was meant to become a filling for a nuclear weapon, uranium. Later, other scientists studied and gave a detailed description of nuclear fission. Unfortunately, the results of their collective work served the interests of the military and helped it pursue the goals you perfectly well know about. Today, almost 15 countries possess nuclear weapons. Their governments are in no hurry to get rid of them, and the worst part is the number of nukes may even grow. It used to take decades to make one bomb. Currently, if you have money and the needed technologies, you can put nuclear warheads into mass production. Or am I wrong? In this video, you'll find out who's in charge of the nuclear balance, how many years does it take to design the weapon, and how is an atomic bomb built in the first place? This video has been made for educational purposes only. What can a nuclear bomb be filled with? Most likely, an isotope of either uranium or plutonium. But if someone decides to start a nuclear weapons program these days, they'll certainly want to keep it a secret, so plutonium is not an option. This element doesn't occur naturally, so you can only get it if you have a reactor, and it can hardly be hidden in the basement. The only option left is uranium. Uranium-238 is the only isotope that's not produced synthetically, but it's useless for building nuclear bombs. To get the required isotope, uranium-235, we need to enrich natural uranium, or in other words, process it. Where can we get the raw materials? Today, the element is commercially produced all over the world, and uranium powder is available for purchase, and it's called yellow cake. Some countries, such as Iran, produce it. Some buy it from a Kazakh company called Kazatomprom. One nuclear explosive requires 50 kilograms of pure uranium-235. That's more than six and a half tons of yellow cake. And considering that a nuclear bomb needs to be tested, we'll need at least three explosives. This equals 20 tons of powder. But buying it isn't the only challenge. We need to somehow transport it and find a place to store it. Say, some nuclear facility. And mind you, nobody should know about it. Iran, for example, has succeeded in this task and keeps its reserves in the magnificent city of Isfahan. Tourists literally stroll along a powder keg and don't even know it. However, there's no danger until uranium gets enriched, and it's a very labor-intensive process. What does it take to enrich uranium? Enriching it means splitting its atoms and separating the needed isotope U-235. For that, uranium has to reach an enormous speed. We need a device able to spin tens of thousands of times a minute, a centrifuge. This is a very sophisticated machine made of many parts that are not so easy to find. The so-called Nuclear Suppliers Group controls the export of the equipment, including the centrifuge's parts. However, there's also an under the counter supply chain, smuggling. But since the illegal market is not very reliable, some countries have developed their own ways of getting the equipment. For instance, North Korea created a shell company in China with a very long name. Shenyang Aircraft Group Dandong Import and Export Company Limited. This tongue twister was almost entirely identical to the name of one Chinese legal firm. The mix-up let North Korea import the pieces and remain unnoticed. <clears throat> So much effort for just one centrifuge, while well, it takes thousands of them to enrich uranium. Together, they form some sort of a cascade, and gaseous uranium moves through it. Okay, let's assume that this tedious process is finished somehow. The job is done. We'll need a year to get 50 kilograms of uranium needed for an explosion. And that's if we exclude the possibility of technical failures, accidents, or a trivial computer worm, such as Stuxnet. In 2010, it caused problems with hundreds of Iran's centrifuges and substantially slowed down the entire system's performance. But anyway, even if you have the right quantity of enriched uranium, but don't have anything else, that's a dead end. You'll need a structure to put it into. 
How long does it take to design and produce a bomb? Meet John Coster Mullen, a truck driver from Wisconsin. Apart from this, he's known as the man who made the little boy and fat man bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Coster Mullen spent 19 years creating their detailed designs. Both of the bombs were implosion type. They contained an enriched uranium sphere and conventional explosives placed around it. The detonator triggers a series of simultaneous small explosions. Under their influence, the sphere located in the middle contracts and reaches its critical mass. As a result, an enormous explosion occurs. A small team of modern scientists who have experience in physics and engineering can design such a bomb within several months, or even faster, if they save time thanks to fast food delivery and darknet. After the designs are ready, here comes the most dangerous dangerous part, production. All this time, enriched uranium has remained in a gaseous state, and what we need is to convert it into metal. To do this, scientists use water, hydrofluoric acid, and magnesium. Then the processed metal needs to be given the desired shape. If we're talking about an implosion-type weapon, this shape is two hemispheres. It's crucial to do everything carefully. Remember that playing with the physical state of uranium creates a very high risk of an accident. I mean, of course, not a large-scale nuclear explosion, but still quite a big one. The laboratory will be ruined, and people working with the device are likely to receive a lethal dose of radiation. And that's not even the finish line. What do we do with the bomb once it's finished? Before using nuclear weapons, it's necessary to test them. Today, these tests would be held underground. This is the only way to stop radioactive fallout from spreading. So, we'll need to dig a giant hole or find an abandoned mine. But even if we do this, we won't be able to make this explosion go unnoticed. Even though there won't be a mushroom cloud, the underground blast will still attract attention. The Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization, headquartered in Vienna, monitors global networks of seismometers and radionuclide identification devices. They can detect even the smallest nuclear explosions, so there's no way to avoid sanctions and penalties. This kind of fate caught up with North Korea. When the country conducted its first nuclear testing in 2006, the UN applied sanctions that led to a significant economic decline. However, no country has ever destroyed its nuclear weapons stockpiles because of the sanctions. The effectiveness of the these punitive measures seems to equal the combat capability of a mosquito net used against a Bengal tiger. Yes, many countries possess nuclear weapons, but the last thing their governments want is to actually use them. What we really need to be aware of is corporations. Nowadays, they're more powerful than many states and can cooperate with governments of belligerent countries, play a game of their own, and call the shots. Have you ever noticed that when sad stories about the end of the human race are told, there's always some logo in the background.